Our last speaker in the conference is uh, Timo Dumler. I've known Timo now for a bunch of years. So Timo currently works at JetBrains. Uh, he is also co-chair of the study group in the ISO C++ committee on uh, contacts, which is a topic that I like. Uh, besides that, uh, another important uh, service he's doing to the community these days is that he has uh, resurrected, I think it's the best word, resurrected uh, CPPcast. So if, if you used to hear CPPcast, probably you should be aware that CPPcast is back. Uh, he's running uh, now this weekly or so? Weeks. Every two weeks. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, cast. And uh, I have heard some of them lately with very interesting topics. So uh, that is something great to hear. I usually put when I am driving and I still didn't have a crash. <laughs> And uh, I, I want to thank you a lot, Timur, uh, for coming. Uh, not always uh, we agree on topics, uh, from time to time only, but I, I think he's doing really a great job. So thank you very, mu very much for coming, and I am eager to hear you. Well, thank you very much, Jose Daniel, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be back here in Madrid. I was here in 2019 as well. And um, yeah, it's just amazing. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about low latency C++. And I did a few talks in the past where, where I was diving quite deep into particular algorithms or particular techniques. I'm not going to do that today. So I'm going to do kind of more like a high level overview. And then whenever there's like a concrete kind of technique, I'm just going to say, here's a talk about somebody about this, or here's a a uh, blog post from somebody about this. So you can kind of dig deeper yourself, but I'm going to do more like, a, like an overview. Um, yeah, so I thank you, Jose Daniel, for uh, reading my bio already, so I can skip through this very quickly. I work at JetBrains. This is my main job. I'm a developer advocate there. Uh, we make developer products. We make C-Line, which is a C++ IDE that I'm sure some of you know and use. We make also ReSharp C++, which is our plugin for Visual Studio. And Rider, which is an IDE for .NET and Unreal uh, game engine development, and also lots of other products for other programming languages. Yeah, I'm also co-host of CUP Cast, as Jose Daniel said, together with Phil Nash. We just released a new episode literally this morning, so tune in. Uh, also, yeah, co-chair of the contract study group on the committee, where, by the way, Jose Daniel is also a regular contributor, so thank you very much for your continuing work. Uh, we are aiming to get contracts into C++26, and hopefully, Together we can figure this out. And then uh, the other thing that I'm also doing is um, I have worked for about a decade of my career in the music tech industry, particular music production software. So uh, about four or five years ago, I founded uh, Cradle, which is a music tech company making uh, audio plugins. This is one of our products, um, the Spirit, which is a vocal processor. So this is kind of the stuff that people use who um, produce music that you listen to on the radio or, um, you know, um, uh, sound soundtracks for um, Hollywood movies and this kind of stuff. And so they use that software. Um, that is typically uh, real-time signal processing, what's happening there. So that's kind of what got me to think about low latency programming and real-time programming. And that's why I got into C++ as well. So this is kind of, uh, out of the different things that I'm doing, this is kind of the background that drove me to this topic. So that you know why I'm talking about this stuff and why I'm interested in this. So you want to talk about low latency, but what actually is low latency? It's like a buzzword that keeps flying around, which you know means maybe something slightly different to different people. And then there's this other word, which I think is more common and has even more different meanings is performance. Like what does performance actually mean? And it turns out one way to look at performance is that it has these two orthogonal aspects to it, right? So there's throughput and latency. And if you visualize a program as a pipe where information is flowing through, then you can imagine that the latency is 
the time it takes if you ask the programmer a question until you get an answer. So that's kind of the length of the, of the pipe, right? And then how long does it take for the water to come out the other end when you open the tap? And then throughput is kind of the, the thickness of the pipe, like how much information can flow through, like per second or whatever time unit. So these are kind of orthogonal aspects of performance. Um, and so there's yet another buzzword in there, which is real time. And real time is a particular flavor of low latency where you're not interested in just minimizing latency, but actually you have some kind of deadline where if the latency is above a certain amount, like one millisecond or one nanosecond or whatever, um, then basically your program is not working the way it should. So one way to define this is to say that if you have a real-time program, then in order to be considered correct, not only does the program have to produce the correct result, but it also has to produce it within a certain amount of time, okay? And so if it doesn't do that, then even if the result was correct, if it arrives too late, the program isn't working properly. So that's kind of real-time programming or one possible definition of real-time programming. And so performance, um, is of course something we're interested in. And we can, we can uh, consider low latency and, and bandwidth to be kind of orthogonal aspects of it. But another way of looking at it is you could also look at it as a spectrum. Like uh, you have all these different aspects of performance that you can optimize for if you're optimizing a program. Are you optimizing for low latency or are you optimizing for high throughput or bandwidth, right? It turns out that depending on what you wanna do, you're gonna end up with different solutions. So you need to be aware of what problem you're actually solving and what to optimize for. Um, so if you're optimizing for high throughput, typically what you want is you want to optimize the average case performance, right? If you're doing a task over and over again, you want kind of to do as many of them as possible per second, or you want you know, the, the whole set of tasks to take as little time as possible. So you're interested in how much time on average does it take to uh, do this task and then uh, you want to minimize that, and then the cumulative effect is going to be that your program is going to be faster. If you're, however, optimizing for low latency, you want to optimize for the worst case performance, right? Because you have this deadline, you, you, like if, if your code takes longer than that, your program is incorrect. Therefore, you want to make sure that you're going to be below that kind of time, but you don't care so much about the average case. Uh, the average case can even be worse, but if you can reason about not being above the deadline, then kind of you're optimizing for the worst case performance, right? So that's something that uh, ends up having a, sometimes different, different strategies that you need to do. And then there is an aspect called efficiency, which is kind of in the middle. And the way I would define efficiency is that you want to reduce the amount of work or the amount of energy needed or something like that that is required to perform a certain task. And it turns out that if you um, increase efficiency, it actually helps both things. If you can increase efficiency, you can increase both the throughput and the latency, right? So that's a very, very good thing. And let me just put a few analogies up here. If you want to optimize for throughput, for example, you want to like add more lanes to your highway, right? So more cars can flow through it. If you want to optimize for the latency, you end up with solutions like, for example, the invention of the telegraph, right? At the time when letters were transported by horses or by, by trains, right? Where if you write a telegram, there's a lot fewer information you can put in there, right? But it's gonna arrive a lot faster, right? So you're really optimizing for latency at the expense of bandwidth or like the amount of information you can put into your, your message. And then efficiency is more like the invention of the wheel, which just makes it overall, you know, much more efficient to transport something from A to B. And that's really gonna help both the throughput and the latency, right? So that's another thing that you really wanna, wanna be looking for. And just to, keep going a little bit with these analogies because I think it's, it's really useful to think about it that way. Let's say you have a problem like you have an intersection. Sorry for the bad drawing. I did that this morning. I hope, <laughs> I hope you, 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 it's still okay to, to, you can see what's going on there. So this is supposed to be a, a intersection with like traffic lights and like two lanes in every direction, right? And so you have cars flowing this way and cars flowing that way. And then you wanna optimize um, the bandwidth. So you wanna optimize kind of the traffic flow, how many cars are, can pass through this intersection in both directions, right? And so if you're optimizing for high throughput, what you're gonna do is you're gonna add more lanes, right? So instead of having two lanes per direction, you're gonna have three. And then more cars can flow through the intersection. That's an optimization for high throughput. Um, a lot of the time uh, you're in a situation where you kind of wanna optimize both and you wanna be in this sweet spot where like throughput and latency are kind of both kind of at some kind of sweet spot, 
Um, and then um, you have that problem often, for example, if you have some kind of server that's reacting to queries, so the latency is relevant, but also there's lots of queries, so bandwidth is also important, so you kind of want to find the ideal compromise. And then you might end up with a completely different solution, like a roundabout, for example, which kind of can help both the traffic flow, but also the latency, because you don't always wait at the red traffic light, right? But then there are these other cases where you want to optimize for low latency, and often you want to optimize for low latency of a particular aspect of your system. For example, in this analogy, you have cars, but you also have buses, right? And you really want the buses to not get stuck in traffic, so then you're going to add a bus lane, you know, where only the buses can go, and then that really optimizes for latency of the buses, not for the throughput, because you have one bus every 10 minutes, for example, so the throughput of the buses is going to stay the same. But they're not going to be stuck in traffic, so you're optimizing for the latency of the buses at the expense of bandwidth and latency of the cars, because you don't care about the cars. You're saying, this is not a critical part of my system, right? And if you want to really uh, uh, drive this to the extreme, and if the latency of the bus is the number one you know, aspect of, of your, your program or your business, then this isn't even the best solution because your bus is still going to wait at the traffic light. And what you really want to do is you want to make sure that the bus doesn't have to wait at the traffic light and it's just uninterrupted flow and the bus can just go from A to B and you route the rest of the traffic in such a way that the bus isn't affected by that at all. Another example is if you're doing some kind of marathon in the city, I'm sure Madrid, I'm sure there's a marathon in Madrid, right? So, so normally you have like traffic flow, but then if you have the marathon, then you put barriers everywhere. So you route all the traffic around them so that the runners don't ever have to stop at the red traffic light. They just keep running and running and running, right? So really optimize for this being kind of the, the fast lane, so to say, at the expense of everybody else, right? So you're not optimizing for bandwidth here. You're optimizing for kind of uh, uh, not stopping, you know, this one particular aspect. And this is something we're going to be uh, seeing, seeing later. So what domains can be considered kind of low latency domains? We have gaming where we, we want to render video frames and you, you don't want to drop frames. So this is something where you have this problem. We have audio processing, which is my background. We have high frequency trading. We had a talk earlier from somebody who works at an exchange. We also have the other side where people work at hedge funds or other kind of companies that do trades. <coughs> So you want to do these trades really fast. You want to do them faster than the competition, and you can make a lot of money. And then we have embedded, which is really a vast field. And, and I guess not all uh, use cases of embedded systems, but a lot of them kind of fall into the slow latency stuff as well. So we have automotive, aeronautics, robotics, medical applications, elevators, all kinds of stuff where you have things where the system has to react really fast, and it has to react within a certain deadline. Otherwise, it's considered incorrect. Right. So you have these real-time constraints in a lot of these systems. So, you know, we can kind of, if you look at this at a, on a spectrum, like what are you optimizing for, we can put these different uh, use cases or these different industries on this kind of like spectrum, right? So for example, in gaming, you're kind of interested a little bit more in latency because you really don't want to drop frames. You want to have a fast frame rate. It's very, very important. But you also want to have bandwidth. Right? You want to render lots of monsters at the same time and they need to look crispy and have lots of detail. So you kind of want to optimize for both, but maybe you're a little bit more in the latency side because you really don't want to drop frames. Then audio, I would say, is, is a lot more extreme, right? Because like you just don't want to drop an audio buffer, otherwise you immediately hear it. And I think high frequency trading is probably on the most extreme of latency is the only thing we really care about. And then embedded is kind of this wide field. It really depends on what you're doing. So I drew this like wide bubble. And then there's other use cases like internet service, uh, that are processing lots of data. And then again, you want latency and true, throughput both to be um, you know, within a good, good parameters, but you're probably a little bit more on the throughput side there. And then there's use cases like also from the finance industry, but not trading, but like there's people who are doing quantitative analysis where they run these big models of the market or something. And you do that kind of offline, right? You're not live interacting with an exchange. So it doesn't really matter the latency, it, more, it matters more that you can run the simulation or whatever you're doing, the model, in a reasonable amount of time. And I think at the very uh, extreme end of that spectrum would be scientific simulations, which is something that I was doing way before I became a C++ developer. I actually spent at some point half a year working here in Madrid at the Universidad Autónoma. I was doing um, astrophysical simulations. And there, 
we really only care about the throughput because you want the simulation to take five days and not 10 days, but you don't really care if like a particular time step in there is gonna take a little bit longer to compute, right? You just care about how much the whole thing can. And so everything that's kind of in the left half, that's what I call low latency programming. And that's purely my own classification. You know, you can disagree with this, but this is kind of the way I see this. And so it turns out that in these low latency programming use cases, pretty much in all of them, in some shape or form, you have this concept of a hot path. And so you have, like we saw with the bus lane or with the marathon uh, runners um, or with the tube, you have some kind of uh, problem or some aspect of your system where you ask a question, you need an answer really fast. And that's kind of the, the one aspect of your system where you wanna optimize for low latency in real time. And you typically have some kind of deadline. And you can also classify these different use cases on a spectrum of how long is that deadline? And that's actually something that's quite different. There's many orders of magnitude between different use cases here. So if you're doing video games, then for example, if you're rendering at 60 hertz, you have 16 milliseconds to render one frame, right? Or maybe if you're like on some high-end PC, you can render a little bit faster than that, so maybe 10 milliseconds. In audio, it's more like order of magnitude of one millisecond. And then if you're doing these kind of high frequency, high frequency trading stuff, it's like several orders of magnitude more to the left. So people are talking about you know, responding within a microsecond, or if you're going from C++ to FPGAs, then it's nanoseconds, right? So I don't work myself in this industry, so you probably, some of you probably who do, they know a lot more about this, but I think we're talking about nanoseconds or microseconds here. So it's definitely a different order of magnitude here. And then embedded, again, depends on what, what you're doing. And just to give you an kind of a feeling of how short that is, one microsecond is the time it takes for light to travel 300 meters, which is the height of the Eiffel Tower, right? So it's really not a lot of time. And then, you know, we have other applications where latency kind of matters, like for example, you're rendering a GUI for some kind of app on your phone or whatever, and then typically, if your lag is more than about 100 millisecond or something like this, then people might notice that. So you kind of also have a deadline there, but typically with this kind of stuff, the deadlines are long enough that this doesn't become the most complicated part of your system. So I would kind of draw a line here and um, kind of consider everything on the left of that line to be kind of low latency or real time applications. And so another difference is what happens if you miss the deadline? What are the consequences of that? And, and that, again, depends on the use case, right? So if you drop a few frames in a video game, probably nobody's gonna notice. If you do that too often, then people will notice, and then you're gonna get bad reviews. People are not gonna buy your game. But typically, if you drop one frame here or there, it doesn't have too much of an impact. In audio, it's much worse. Like, if you drop a frame, it's an instantly audible click or glitch. So if that happens to a audio processing synthesizer or something like this, people are not gonna buy it, right? Because if it's gonna be glitching, you can't use it in any kind of studio setting. Um, it gets progressively worse as you get down this list. So if you're doing trading and you're not as fast as the competition, you can lose a lot of money. Um, and then finally, if you're in some of the embedded systems where you do something like medical or maybe military applications or something like this, uh, you know, people can die if your system is not fast enough. So, you know, it's really something worth thinking about. What are the consequences of uh, missing your deadline there? How important is it to, to stick to our real-time constraint? And so this is kind of the hot path, and this hot path has another property which I call the topology, which is kind of what shape does it have within your program flow? And it's a bit uh, maybe Maybe a bit of an unusual way to look at this, but I think it's interesting. So, so uh, for example, audio, which is where kind of I'm, my background is, you have this situation where you have um, typically a callback coming from the operating system every one to 10 milliseconds, depending on your sample rate and buffer size and um, settings like that. And then in one or two or five milliseconds, the next callback comes and then the next callback comes and then the next callback comes and, and you have to, basically write a new audio buffer into the memory you're given uh, before the next callback comes around, otherwise you get a glitch, right? And so that happens on typically on one thread, which is the audio thread, or people call it the real-time thread or the, the processing thread. And then you have a bunch of other threads in your app, like rendering the GUI, reacting to 
uh, kind of MIDI when you're playing a keyboard or doing file I.O. or whatever. And those threads don't have these constraints, right? And then you kind of have to synchronize those threads. And then in gaming on, on many systems, it's kind of similar. You also have this deadline, it's a bit longer. But what people do there on certainly modern consoles is, uh, or modern PCs is that you want to render on multiple threads. So that's a bit different. But you know, in the end, it's kind of also a low latency setting just with like a slightly different shape. And then if you're in finance, maybe your topology looks like this where you, you get some input and then most of the time you don't want to do anything, but when you decide here I need to do a trade, uh, you want to send an order very, very quickly. Um, and, and maybe maybe these come regularly, maybe they don't come regularly. Um, you know, it depends on the on the particular uh, system. And then when we go to embedded, we have systems. We have many different ways to do this in embedded, right? But you can do something with interrupts, which kind of looks very similar to the audio callbacks, but they're kind of hardware interrupts, uh, where you get sensor data, for example, from a robot or something, and then you need to decide, you know, what to do um, again quickly. Um, or another strategy on embedded systems is the called super loop, where you have like basically just an infinite loop in your main and it's doing, you know, sensor this, sensor that, like, and you, you know, these different tasks. And it just keeps doing them in a the loop again and again and again. But you don't want any of these tasks to take too long because otherwise everything stops, right? Because it's just a loop. So you have these slightly different topologies, slightly different shapes, but, but this concept of um, a hot path is kind of more or less the same everywhere. So this is why I think across all of these industries, we can look at low latency or real time and, and reason about it in a way that doesn't depend on the particular use case. And this is something that I'm, I'm kind of very interested in. So you know, another, this is the last uh, uh, attempt to categorize these um, that I have here. Um, I can categorize these use cases uh, based on you know, how performant the hardware is that it runs on and how much control I have over that hardware. So for example, in audio, uh, if you have like a music app or something, it runs on consumer hardware, right? So it, you know, laptop, Mac, Windows, Linux, phone, Android, iOS, you don't really have much control over, you know, what these, how these devices, uh, how performant they are. Some of them are gonna be fast, some of them are gonna be not so fast. Uh, in gaming, um, but usually they're like reasonably fast, right? So in gaming, you can either do that or if you, um, if you develop for a console, then maybe you do have more control over it, or not control, but more information, because you're, if you're targeting a particular console, you know the parameters. And then if you're doing trading, you, it's actually your hardware, it's not the consumer's hardware, it's like your server that's in the rack, right? So you can tweak it, you can install your custom network cards, you have like a very high level of control over um, you know, what hardware you run your code on, and it's also typically very, very performant. And I think embedded is kind of on the other side of that where you have even more control because they're literally designing the hardware. But then typically it's like a lot more resource constraint than, than stuff that runs on servers or on consumer hardware. And that brings its own problems on top of all the low latency stuff, which I'm not really an expert in that. I'm not gonna talk too much about that because I don't work in embedded. I don't have much experience with like these constraint systems, but it's another really, really interesting uh, field. So, okay, this is kind of what we're talking about when we do low latency programming, but why do we use C++ for this? Why is C++ really the best programming language for this? Well, one reason certainly is that we have manual memory management, right? So allocating, deallocating memory, you know, slows stuff down, but in C++ you can deterministically decide when that happens, and so it doesn't happen in our hot path. You don't have a garbage collector or anything like that. Um, C also has that, but another thing that we have in C++, which we don't really have in C to that extent, is scalable zero-cost abstractions, right? We have templates, you have algorithms, uh, containers, all the stuff. For example, I don't know, you wanna, you have some kind of sequence and you wanna do some simple algorithm on it. You don't have to actually write out uh, all the code for the exact data type that you're, you're working on, right? You, can, you have a container which is templated on a data type, you have algorithms, you have iterators, you can stick a lambda in there, and in C, it's probably going to be some kind of function pointer, so that's like an indirection, whereas in C++, you can give it a lambda, that's gonna be inlined at compile time, that's not gonna have a performance overhead, right? So, so we have all of these scalable zero-cost abstractions in C++. And there's another language that has both of them, and it starts with R, um, but that language also doesn't have one thing that C++ does have, <coughs> which is C++ has a huge body of existing libraries and frameworks 
for all of these use cases, right? So for example, in the audio industry, we have Juice, which is, I think, something like 80% of all audio plugins are written in Juice, which is this big framework that basically solves all the plumbing for you. Uh, the gaming people have things like Unreal Engine or other frameworks, which really lets you focus on your product and, and provide all the plumbing that you need. And I don't think Rust really has anything as you know, kind of battle tested and uh, comprehensive as these frameworks for these kinds of industries. So C++ is great for this kind of stuff. Um, and how do we use C++ for this kind of stuff? Like how do we program C++ for low latency programming? And it turns out there's like a whole range of techniques. And again, it depends on what you wanna optimize for. If you wanna optimize for high throughput, there are certain techniques. If you wanna optimize for low latency, there's certain techniques. And then there's a lot of techniques that target just efficiency, but that's the thing that you, you know, is always useful. So in this talk or in the remainder of this talk, you wanna focus on techniques for both low latency and efficiency, not so much for high throughput at the expense of latency, because that's not what we want, want, that's not what we want to do for these kind of use cases. So we can categorize the different C++ techniques into techniques that are targeting efficiency, just in general, making stuff faster or more efficient or requiring less work. And we can, we have also uh, techniques that are targeting low latency specifically, like optimizing for the worst case. So those are two different buckets of techniques that I'm gonna be talking about. But before we do any of this, of course, the most crucial thing is to measure your code. Because if you don't measure your code, you have no idea if it's efficient or fast or any of those things, right? And Actually, it turns out that intuition about this stuff is often very wrong and you'd really have to measure. I just wanna give two um, references here. Further Picos has a book about efficient programs and then Dave Rowland gave a great talk last year about optimization and both of them have examples where you have a piece of code and then you do something where, oh, obviously the code is now more efficient. It's gonna do less work or it's gonna be more, you know, the algorithmic complexity has been reduced or something like this. And then you measure it and it turns out it's actually slower than before. And it turns out if you dig why that is, it turns out that you know, there are things that depend on the hardware or other things, we're gonna look into some of those things that you haven't considered. So always measure many, many ways to do this, right? There's profiling uh, and we have all of these tools for profiling depending on what platform you are, right? There's like per Gprof, Vtune, depending on compiler and operating system you're on. There's also this difference between sampling profiling and instrumentation profiling. Um, so Mathieu Roper did a really good talk about this at CDPCon 2021. It kind of talks about the difference and all the different tools. It's kind of a very beginner friendly talk, so I recommend that one. And then there's another one by Chandler Carruth that I wanna mention, which is from a few more years back, which is a lot more, okay, let's dig into like more, more the hardcore stuff, but also kind of how do you profile it in practice and it's, um, Kind of really, both of them, the talks are very different but very interesting. Um, beyond profiling, you have other types of performance analysis, right? So you have tools that can measure things like catch misses or branch mispredicts or how often you call into the operating system or how often you allocate memory. Uh, there's a tool, LLVM MCA, which measures performance of particular machine instructions on a particular CPU. Um, you can look at the assembly that your compiler generated and you can you know, get information from that too. So obviously we have Compiler Explorer for that, that I think probably everybody here knows. Um, in C line, which is the IDE we make at JetBrains, we just added a feature in the last release, which is also really cool, it's called Disassembly on Demand. So if you have uh, a C++ code open, you can just switch to the assembly view while you're debugging it. And you have like the C++ code and the instructions kind of side by side uh, as you're debugging it on your machine. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, for kind of actual big projects that you're working on that you can't just put on Compiler Explorer. And then benchmarking, of course, measuring the actual performance of something. And there's many tools for that as well. You can measure your actual code, which is what you should always be doing. Uh, but you can also do micro benchmarks to benchmark a particular case, right? And they're tricky. So if you're just micro benchmarking a particular algorithm in isolation, you might not be measuring the same thing as the thing that the algorithm is doing in your program, right? So uh, you can see cache effects that are very different from the real program. So you need to warm the cache, you need to randomize the heap. Otherwise you might have a very different memory layout from the one that is in your actual program. Uh, you should measure a release build, the optimized build, because otherwise you really don't know 
what that's doing, but also you should be mindful that if you not measure the actual code, but just an isolated piece, there might be optimizations happening that change what the code is actually doing. So again, you're not measuring the actual code that you want to measure. So it's kind of worms, micro benchmarks, very tricky to get right. Uh, but that's kind of what you have to do if you want to if you want to write efficient uh, low latency programs. So now that we know how to measure our code, we can actually write code. And so, as I said, there are like two uh, buckets of um, kind of techniques. There's techniques targeting kind of overall efficiency, and then there's low latency specific stuff. So I want to just give a brief overview of some things that are just targeting efficiency more broadly, which is very good for low latency systems, but also kind of stuff that people who um, optimize for bandwidth or throughput are also probably going to be looking at and benefiting from. So if you wanna, um, if you wanna write efficient code, you really have to know uh, your programming language very well, in this case C++, and the libraries or frameworks that you're using. Your compiler, right? Different compilers have different things that they're doing, um, ABI, um, and then, um, those things, I think, there are pretty good resources on them. You know, there's books, there's talks, there's documentation. But then you kind of also really have to know the hardware architecture that you're targeting. And this is where kind of the available literature gets a lot thinner. Uh, if you want to write efficient code, you kind of need to know stuff about how the CPU architecture works. You need to know about how the cache works and different levels of cache, uh, the prefetcher, the branch predictor, other aspects of the hardware, right? So, um, there is a resource for at least Intel platforms, which is Agna Fogg's optimization manuals. I'm sure some of you have seen this. It's a very extensive body of work for optimizing uh, on Intel uh, x86. It's a bit dated. I think like the latest generations of chips have stuff that isn't really covered as well in those manuals, but it's still a very interesting resource. For ARM, which is becoming increasingly important, like this laptop here is an, has an ARM processor in it, right? So none of this stuff from Agnafog applies. For ARM, I don't really know a good uh, optimization manual or anything like this beyond like the usual ARM documentation. So if anybody knows uh, kind of a resource that's talking about optimizing for ARM, I would be actually really interested in that because it's becoming more and more important. Um, and then, yeah, so there's these different levels, right? So you know the language, you know the hardware, but just on the language level, there's lots of stuff you can do. And, Number one thing, and this is just some examples, right? I'm just gonna get very, very high level kind of overview. Something that um, you wanna be doing for efficiency is you wanna avoid unnecessary work, right? So you wanna avoid unnecessary copies, unnecessary function calls or indirections, and you wanna make as many decisions and perform as many computations as possible at compile time, unless you really care about compile times for some reason. But if you're optimizing for low latency, you probably don't care about compile times as much as you care about runtime performance. So yeah, avoiding unnecessary copies. There's lots of pitfalls there. This is, I guess, a classic example. I've seen this. I, I'm pretty sure I've made this mistake a few times myself uh, when I was starting out. And I, I'm seeing this often in code reviews where you know, somebody doesn't know that if you loop through a vector and you write it like this, then you're gonna be copying every element. And sometimes the compiler can optimize it out. Sometimes it can't. But if you put const ref there, then you can avoid these copies, right? Another you know, slightly more uh, involved example is here you have some kind of string, <coughs> uh, sorry, vector of strings. It doesn't really matter what happens there. And you're looking for, um, uh, you have some kind of prefix string here and then you um, capture that in this lambda which you pass onto this algorithm. And then in the lambda you're concatenating it with another string, a literal, and then you do something with that. And then you can go ahead and say, well, but, you know, this is uh, something that I'm performing, you know, every time in the loop because it's a loop, right? You're passing a lambda to find if, that's gonna be a loop. So you're gonna be doing this every time around the loop, it's gonna create a new string, it's gonna allocate memory. So why don't you just put that into an init capture in the lambda and then you can just do that computation once and not every time, right? So that's gonna save you a lot of CPU cycles. And if you watch people's talks about how to efficiently code in C++, you're gonna see many, many, many such examples, right? So um, there's a huge amount of, of things that you can do um, just with this kind of, just avoid unnecessary work, right? And that also involves avoiding unnecessary function calls and indirections, so it's good to have your functions inlined. Uh, virtual functions, right, are 
potentially multiple indirections. Uh, so if you care about latency and efficiency, you can instead use the variant. You can use the currency recurring template pattern, which in C++23 actually became a lot easier because now we have deducing this, which makes it really, really easy to write CRTP because you don't need to currently recurring thing anymore. You just need to just write the template and then it's gonna deduce the correct type for you. So if you look up deducing this, you're gonna find some talks and articles on this topic and why it's awesome. And of course you wanna make as many decisions as possible at compile time. So const explore all the things. There's also lots of talks about that. That's a good thing to do. Template meta programming. One thing that we do in audio is that if you, um, a lot of the time if you're doing math, you have lookup tables, you can generate those at compile time, right? So since it was just 20, a lot of the containers are const expert, a lot of the algorithms are const expert. You're making more and more math stuff const expert in the standard. So you can do more and more of the stuff at compile time, including you know, computing whole lookup tables and, and do the math there completely at compile time. Well, if you do math at runtime, you can use efficient mathematical operations, right? So one thing that uh, a lot of people are doing are fast approximations. So for example, in audio, you have to convert a lot between log scale and linear scale. So you have ex, uh, exp, um, exponentiation and logarithm, which are very slow. So you can have a fast approximation of that that is good enough, uh, but runs a lot faster. Uh, the gaming people, they have to compute one over square root a lot because they need that to do 3D geometry. So they have, this is for example, a very famous fast approximation of that, which I'm sure some of you have seen. It's from the 90s on Quake 3, where they found that you know, there's this function which uses just a few simple operations and a magic number, and that gets you the inverse square root of a number within 0.1% precision very, very, very quickly. Uh, except, of course, please don't write that because that's undefined behavior, right? That's type punning. Uh, please write it like this. It's going to compile down to the same thing, but it's going to use type safe and not undefined behavior ways to write the same thing. Um, I have a talk just about this. Uh, it's called Type Panning in Modern C++ uh, from a few years back, where I talk about bitcast and other ways to do this stuff safely. And so if you're, if you're playing this game, which you have to do a lot in, in like low latency programming, that you're kind of doing bit fiddling and this kind of stuff, if you don't want to introduce UB into your code, you really, really have to know the language rules really well. So you need to be aware of like object lifetime, uh, aliasing rules, like memory alignment. It's like UB to have an object that isn't aligned according to the alignment requirement of that type. Uh, object representations, value representations, which is not the same thing. Um, it's the bit cast which you now have, so you don't have to do mem copy or these like uh, ugly kind of casts from one type to a completely unrelated type. Uh, we have implicit lifetime types in C++20, which is something that helps a little bit with the object lifetime rules. So now you can, under certain conditions, cast to a type of an object that actually isn't there, but then the standard is gonna make it so that the object is going to spring to life in that moment and it's no longer UB. And then we have, on top of that, we have a facility called Stutzart Lifetime As in C23, which I was involved in standardizing that, uh, which kind of lets you kind of manually do that. So if, if you look that up, it's one of like, we keep adding those kind of facilities that make this bit fiddling not UB and kind of safer, but still as fast. And this is kind of what you wanna do um, if you do this kind of programming. So fast approximations, another classic is using powers of two for sizes and similar things because then the compiler can um, replace things like division or mod, which are very slow with bit shifts. And you can get 100x speed up in certain cases just by doing that, right? Uh, and there's many, many other techniques. Many people who are you know, much smarter than me have done lots of talks about this, so uh, you can go and watch them. Um, undefined behavior in the optimizer. We already talked about this a little bit. You, know, you, you do some low-level stuff, but then uh, you trigger undefined behavior. And then also optimizing, kind of optimizing an undefined behavior is kind of two sides of the same coin in a way, right? Because Optimization requires the compiler to assume certain things. Well, this can never happen, therefore I can optimize based on the assumption that this can never happen. But then if it does happen, it's UB. Things like signed integer overflow or like these type punning things where you're like casting to a type that isn't there, things like that. Um, but in CSS22, we actually added a tool that lets you ride the dragon of undefined behavior and the optimizer. Um, 
It's called assume. Uh, it's a, a new attribute that we have in C++ 23, and that lets you directly inject assumptions into the compiler. So this is kind of a very sharp knife, but if you wield it correctly in the right situations, it can give you this extra nanosecond that you need in some of these cases. So um, here's an example. This is a toy example. You have a function that divides a number by 32. And then on Clang, this is the machine code that you get if you compile it with O3, right? But now you can inject the assumption that this number is never going to be negative because you know. And then what, what's going to happen is that the compiler is not going to check it. So what Assume does, it, it tells the compiler, I know it's never negative. It's you know checked or it's guaranteed that this is the case somewhere else in my code, which is maybe invisible to the optimizer because it's in a different translation unit or something. But I know it's never going to be negative. It's an invariant in my code. And I'm going to tell the optimizer that this is the case. And then the compiler can, without checking it, optimize based on the assumption that this assumption uh, is true. And then the compiler can say, well, the number can, can, you know, never is never negative. So I don't have to consider negative numbers at all. I don't have to emit instructions for that. And it's just going to uh, emit you instructions for you know, bit shift by five, which is you know, much less code and much faster. Of course, if you then give this function a negative number, anything can happen. You at least are going to get like numerically the wrong result. And you know, in the worst case, the compiler can optimize away you know, the whole code path that leads to this line of code and really weird things can happen. Right? So this is kind of optimization, but also undefined behavior if you get it wrong. So you need to use this really, really carefully. Here's a real world example of this, again from audio. You have um, an audio signal, which is basically just an array of floats. Um, and then uh, you want to clamp all of these floats to numbers between minus one and one. Right? It's kind of a common operation. Uh, but then if you inject certain assumptions there, like for example, you know that the you know, array, so I'm, I'm giving like a pointer and a size, it's like this old school API. Don't do this, use you know, uh, uh, span if you can, but some APIs, they just work like this, unfortunately. But we can say, okay, we know that the array is never gonna be empty and we know that the array size is always going to be um, a multiple of 32, okay? Because this is how our file format works that we have just read and we just know this, right? And you can also say that, um, uh, you know, the numbers are not gonna be none or infinite or anything like this. And if you inject all of these assumptions into your code, the compiler can go in and, you know, make a more efficient loop that doesn't have an epilogue and a prologue and do more efficient vectorization. And, you know, uh, um, it can actually, in some compilers, it looks into the header uh, where std clamp is defined and like rips out a lot of instructions that you don't need if it doesn't have to consider none and infinite and stuff like this. So you get, uh, um, you know, I measured this, uh, uh, on several compilers, and some com compilers you get like uh, code reduction, like the amount of code re reduced by a factor of two or even three, right? So you get much more efficient code gen. Um, so yeah, compilers and optimizers, but also keep in mind the hardware, of course. Hardware is very complex. Um, this is a diagram of CPU architecture from something like 10 or 15 years ago. So this is all outdated. It's even more complex today, right? And we have, this thing in there, uh, the CPU pipeline. And there's many effects that you don't understand if you don't know how this works, right? So for example, um, if you look at the CPU pipeline here, we have things like the branch predictor, right? So if the blue instruction is a branch, then we don't know which is gonna be the next instruction, right? But if we, uh, if we need to wait for that to evaluate, we're gonna have a pipeline stall, right? We're gonna wait until the whole pipeline goes through before we can execute the red instruction. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a branch prediction. We're gonna say, we think this branch is gonna be taken or not taken, and then uh, the red instruction is gonna be this one, and we're gonna speculatively execute that. And that's really fast, and if you guessed wrong, then you have to rewind, and then you're gonna get slow down. But um, a lot of the time it works really well, and modern hardware is, you know, they spend a lot of resources on designing these, uh, these branch predictors really, really well. So here's my favorite uh, code example to really highlight, like to really measure the effect of this. So we have um, you know, a vector um, and we put a bunch of random numbers in there and then we count how many of them are positive, right? So it's gonna be on average half of them are gonna be positive. We're just gonna go through this vector and count how many of them are positive. 
Right, so that's going to, and what you're going to do is you're going to benchmark just how long it takes to do the count if. Right? And now what you're going to do is you're going to sort the vector before you're going to do the count if. And then we're going to measure again how long the count if takes. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be faster. It's going to be a lot faster. Actually, uh, you can kind of estimate the length of the, of the CPU pipeline by the factor of how much faster it is but you can get 6x, 8x speed up, right? Even though you're doing the exact same work. The only difference is you're doing the work in a different order so that first all the negative numbers come and then all the positive numbers come. So the branch predictor doesn't have to guess all the time. So, so the branch, you're not gonna get branch mispredicts because the branch is either gonna be taken a bunch of times and then later it's gonna be not taken a bunch of times. But it's not gonna be like taken, not taken, not taken, taken, which is exactly if you have this randomness, then the branch predictor can't do its job and then you get this massive slowdown. And so there are many uh, um, cases where you do wanna optimize for this. And so um, here's an example kind of something that maybe finance people might be doing is you have some kind of order and, and you want to branch on something uh, and depending on whether you're branching, you're going to send the order to the exchange or not send the order to the exchange, right? And sending the order to the exchange has to be really, really, really fast. And so um, we have these attributes uh, since C++20, I think, likely and unlikely, and you can stick them onto the branch that you think is going to be more likely to be taken. And then you can tell the optimizer, please optimize for this branch to be taken rather than the other one. Except unfortunately, it turns out it doesn't quite work. So, so yes, you can use this attribute, but it turns out it doesn't actually affect, affect the branch predictor at all because modern CPUs do not have instructions to give a hint to the branch predictor. The branch predictor is kind of an isolated part of your CPU, which is doing its job. You can't tell the branch predictor, oh, please do this instead of that. There are no instructions for that. So no attribute would you know, affect this. The only thing that these attributes affect is the code layout. So if you have like 10 different cases and you put likely on one case, the compiler might or might not reorder it so that you know, the, the case that you want is gonna be kind of towards the beginning and it might or might not be a bit better for the kind of uh, the, the instruction cache, right? And so then you might or might not get a speed up, but most of the time you don't. Uh, people have looked into this uh, there is an article um, by Aaron Bauman about this, and there is a, I highly recommend this talk by Amir Kirsch and Toma Roman about this, where they actually benchmarked this quite extensively on GCC. Um, and they found that actually sometimes likely and unlikely slow down your code because the in internal heuristics of GCC, of like how to optimize the code layout for branches are actually so good that a lot of the time, the code layout you get from not doing anything is better and the code layout that you, that you get from overriding this by just putting these attributes in there, right? And so another thing that you get um, with, um, when you have this kind of pipeline is not just kind of you have to predict branches, but also you have this thing, data dependencies, right? If you don't have branches, but for example, the blue instruction computes uh, like a value and then the red instruction needs that value to do its thing. There's a direct data dependency, it's called a data hazard. And then you also get a slowdown because then the red instruction need to wait for the blue instruction to fully execute before it can do its thing. So you, again, you get a pipeline stall because you have a data hazard. Here's an example of this. Uh, this is a function that kind of just very naively takes a uh, string and parses it as an integer, right? So it's kind of this integer parser. You have like a string literal that encodes uh, a number and then it's gonna parse what number it is. And then this is kind of the naive way to do this. But the problem here is that you have this really hot loop and then uh, you compute a result and then that result is needed immediately for the next iteration of the same loop. And there's nothing in between. And so that's exactly when you get a data hazard and you get these pipeline stalls. And, and so Andre Alexandrescu actually um, gave a talk quite a while ago about this particular case and how to optimize for this. And, and uh, in his talk, he talks you through how to optimize this kind of stuff and get, uh, I think, a 40% speed up or something by doing some tricks to get rid of the data hazard there. Another thing that highly depends on the hardware but get, can get you a lot of performance is SIMD, right? Single instruction, multiple data. So you have one instruction by which you can uh, do the same operation like multiplication or addition on uh, you know, two or four or eight numbers at the same time with one instruction because you have these special registers that are wider that fit 
uh, multiple numbers and, and you have special instruction to do these, uh, these operations. So it's kind of a, way, a, a type of parallelism, right? And it depends on the CPU, right? On Intel platforms, you have SSE, we have AVX, which is like the more modern one. On ARM, we have Neon, et cetera, et cetera. And there's like three ways to use SIMD. You can use the auto vectorizer, which means you just write plain C++ code and then you let the auto vectorizer SIMDify it for you, which works uh, a lot of the time. You can uh, then, if that doesn't give you the right result, and sometimes the algorithm is too complex, the, the optimizer can't quite figure it out. So you need to explicitly uh, insert SIMD instructions, and there's two ways of doing this. You can either uh, use um, SIMD libraries, like Matthias Kretz is trying to get one into the standard, so hopefully we're gonna have that in C++26. And in the meantime, we have a few third party libraries that can do that for you. Or you can write the raw um, kind of intrinsics, SIMD intrinsics. At that point, you're hardware dependent, right? You're, you have to write it separately for every platform. And then there's this technique called SWAR, uh, SIMD within a register, where you don't <coughs> use SIMD registers at all. You just use regular registers, like 64-bit registers. Then you have, for example, two 32-bit numbers, and you squeeze them in there, and you treat them as if they were one 64 number. And, and do some tricks in there to, again, do like essentially two multiplications, for example, with one instruction. So here's an example of code that doesn't auto-vectorize, but if you tweak it a little bit, it does auto-vectorize, and then you get SIMD and you get a massive speed up. So here is a loop, and we have a bunch of arrays, and um, we're doing something, it doesn't really matter exactly what we're doing, but the point is that inside this hot loop, we're using uh, the i-th element of b and the i plus one element of b, right? So we're using kind of different elements of the same array in the same hot loop. And this is kind of one of those cases where the auto vectorizer can't quite vectorize this because like the different elements of the array are not independent. So you have to transform this loop to make them independent. And you can write this loop instead, which is exactly the same thing, but you kind of shift it by half a loop, right? So it's doing the same thing but you change it in such a way that now you never have multiple elements from the same array being used in the same loop, right? So it's doing the exactly the same thing. You just slightly shifted how to write the loop, but now all of a sudden the compiler can auto vectorize it and you can you get a massive speed up, right? So here's the kind of uh, assembly output on Clang, for example, for the left and the right code. On the left, you don't get SIMD instructions. On the right, you do, right? So kind of be aware of you know, the auto vectorizer sometimes kicks in, sometimes doesn't kick in. This is one of those cases where it's really useful to look at the generated assembly. And then, of course, another aspect of uh, hardware is the memory hierarchy, right? So we have registers, then we have L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, and they're progressively farther away from the CPU and slower. So each level is like one order of magnitude slower than the previous one. And so, you know, a lot of um, what people are doing who are writing efficient programs as they're optimizing for this, for, for, for cache, right? So if you start with registers, registers are really interesting. So uh, you want your, your values to be in the registers because they're much faster than cache or main memory, but you also don't want to have too much stuff in the registers because then you get too much register pressure, right? And then kind of your system is, has to wait because there's, you have more stuff in flight than you have registers for. So if you have something like this where you're passing an integer that doesn't change, you know, maybe, I mean, that's gonna go into a register, but to alleviate the register pressure, maybe it's a better idea to pass it as a non-tap template parameter at compile time. You know, then you're not gonna use, use a register for this. Another example that has to do with registers is if you have a um, non-trivial destructor, then on Itanium ABI, uh, you can't put that object into a register even though it's just an int, right? So again, that's gonna have a performance implication. So you gotta know your ABI. And then I guess the most important aspect of this um, kind of efficiency is to optimize for the cache and to minimize cache misses because that's, if your program is too slow, typically cache misses is the dominating thing and anything else you're doing about the algorithmic complexity of your code or how fast a particular mathematical operation takes or anything, anything else that your code is doing is often negligible compared to the penalty you get from having cache misses. Um, and so, um, you know, you want to have your data local in space and in time. You want to align it on cache lines. Uh, you want to do contiguous data traversal, which is very good for the cache, but also very good for the prefetcher, which kind of guesses which bit of data you're going to do next, right? So again, you want to be friendly to that. 
Uh, so almost always, as we heard actually in the previous talk, um, so the vector is the fastest uh, container, even though it doesn't have theoretically the best algorithmic complexity, but it's the most cache friendly one. If you need an associative container, um, a lot of the time it turns out that, you know, things based on trees or other things are actually very unfriendly to the cache and you want to have something that's contiguous. So since C++23, we have flat set and flat map in the standard, which have the same API as flat as set and map, but they're not trees. They're basically a sorted vector like underneath, or actually for map, there's like two sorted vectors, one for keys and one for values. And that's a lot more cache friendly. It's going to be a lot uh, faster in many cases. And AppCell also has containers that do this. And it's not just about containers, it's also about algorithms. A lot of algorithms can be optimized for the cache, like binary search, for example, right? I guess you know what binary search is. You kind of hop in the middle and then you kind of zone in on the element that you're looking for. If you draw a heat map of you know, what elements are, going, are being hit how often, if you do a binary search, this is what this heat map looks like. It's not very cache friendly, right? You're bouncing around a lot. But there is this thing called cache friendly binary search where you kind of just reorder things a little bit so that the heat map looks like this. And it's gonna be a lot faster even though the amount of steps you're doing is the same, just by kind of reordering how your data structure works. So uh, there's a lot of talks about this topic. I just wanna highlight one that I liked, but in particular, Eduardo Madrid did one, I think it was C++ Now last year, uh, uh, which was originally about hash tables, but he also mentions this cache-friendly binary search there, and I found that really, really interesting. And so we don't have just data cache, we also have instruction cache, and it's the same thing there. You want to avoid cache misses in your instruction cache, which is where the code lives that you're actually executing, right? So you wanna consider the layout of your code, the alignment of your code. You wanna avoid branches because you might jump to instructions that are not in the instruction cache. So it's kind of similar to when you're traversing a data structure, it's the same, you're traversing the code you're executing. You don't wanna to have too many branches in there, you want it to be nice and local. You wanna avoid virtual functions, that's potentially multiple indirections, right? V table, and then within the V table, you jump to the right function. So use the variant, use compile time polymorphism like CRTP, mixin, deducing this makes it a lot easier in C++23. And then um, how do you deal with this case of um, you wanna execute a piece of code that actually isn't in the cache or you wanna, you wanna um, access data that actually isn't in the cache. You have, in some of these low latency applications, uh, you have stuff that isn't executed very often or data that isn't accessed very often. So it's not gonna be in the cache but that's the hot path. So how do you make it be in the cache even though it's not being used most of the time? Well, you have to, you know, for data, you can just periodically poke the data on the timer. You don't actually do anything with it. You just read it on a timer over and over again and not do anything with it. But if you do that, it's gonna stay hot in the cache. And then if you actually need the data, it's there. You're not gonna have a cache miss. And you can do the same with the instruction cache. So for example, again, in, in these finance applications, sometimes you, uh, want to send these orders really quickly, but you don't send orders very often. Um, so so um, these instructions are not gonna be in the instruction cache, which is, by the way, often even worse than, than a branch predictor miss. And so what you wanna do is you want that code, even though you're not actually running it most of the time, you want it to be hot in the instruction cache. So what finance people are doing is they, they run this code path periodically, again on a timer or something like this, over and over and over again, um, and just, they, they pass it like some kind of flag, and then at the end, don't actually send the order to the exchange, and it's just like a bit somewhere that, you know, doesn't influence the code flow, so you just call the code, call the code, but then at the very end, the network card knows, oh, if this bit is set, I'm not actually gonna do anything. So you're just kind of dummy running the code, which isn't doing anything, it's not sending anything anywhere, but it's staying hot in the instruction cache, right? So there's many, many talks about this where you can, you know, uh, hear about more techniques for cache-friendly programming. There's a recent one by Avilav Misch. Uh, there's a good one by Bjorn Fahler. I've done one a few years ago, and then I guess the classic is Scott Myers. Uh, highly recommend that one. And yeah, this is, this is all I have on um, efficient programming. I wanna just quickly talk, I think I have a few more minutes, right? I can talk a little bit uh, okay, I can talk a little bit about uh, low latency programming where you 
you don't optimize for bandwidth, but you optimize for low latency. And um, the thing about the latency is that you're, you can't, if you're optimizing for never being slower than a certain amount of time, there are certain things that you cannot do, right? So you cannot allocate or deallocate dynamic memory because that's a non-deterministic amount of time that that takes. You can't block the thread, take a mutex. You can't do any IO, like C out or something like this. It's way too slow. Um, you can't raise exceptions because that's another memory allocation. You really don't want a context switch between user and kernel mode. You don't want to do any syscalls because typically they're not going to be real-time safe. They're not going to have a deterministic amount of time that they're going to finish in. Uh, you don't want to call into any unknown code, actually, and you don't want to um, have loops if you don't know exactly how, you know, how many loop iterations max you're going to get. And you don't want to have any algorithms where yeah, they have, you have O of N or O of log N, and you don't, you don't know what N is, right? N is a runtime property. Then you can't reason about how long it takes for this code to execute. You cannot reason about the code being not longer than your deadline, and therefore it's not real-time safe. So you can't use algorithms that allocate, actually. Little quiz, hash include algorithm. Lots of algorithms in there. Some of them might allocate memory, actually, even though you're just working with ints or something like this, but they might do a memory allocation. So whenever you see something like this in the standard which says complexity, if enough extra memory is available, this is the complexity, otherwise that is the complexity. You know, that means, you know, if you allocate an extra memory buffer, there's a algorithmically faster implementation, but then you get an allocation. You don't want that on a hot path. So there's three algorithms in the standard that have this property. Stable source, stable partition, and in-place merge. Those will do a dynamic memory allocation if you call them, so don't do that on your hot path. And don't use data structures that allocate, right? So you can use all of these because they're just on the stack. Um, you can't use any of these. Anything with type erasure or dynamic memory allocation, right? There's alternatives. Um, static vector is not on a standard yet. We are, I think there's a paper to standardize it, but there's a third party library. It's basically a stack vector, a vector that has a fixed capacity, but everything is on the stack. Uh, the same exists for std function, like a stack only version of std function, which if the function object is too big, you're gonna get a compiler error because it doesn't fit into the stack space. But it's never gonna allocate dynamic memory. Or you can use custom allocators. And there really, there's this trade-off again, bandwidth or latency, right? So there's many uh, allocators out there. There's, for example, TC malloc, which is the Google one, which is really famous, really performant, but it's optimized for bandwidth, not for latency. So, you know, it's doing a lot of stuff. It's faster than malloc, but if it runs out of memory, it's gonna call malloc. You don't want that in a real-time system, right? So you need to pre-allocate everything. So you're gonna work with monotonic allocators that just, you know, allocate a piece of a chunk of memory up front, and then when you try to allocate memory, they're just gonna give you sub-chunks. And there's slightly more complicated stuff that you can do on top, like pool allocators, frame allocators, the game people do, um, arena allocators, and all of that stuff. Uh, there's also lock-free allocators where you can allocate on a different thread, uh, like if, if a certain watermark has been kind of exceeded, and then you have a lock-free queue to shovel that into the other thread. There's like more complicated stuff. But you can't do run-of-the-mill allocators because they're typically not, not real-time safe. Uh, you can't use the mutex or any of these other synchronization primitives that we have in a standard, none of them. You can only use the atomic if you want to synchronize between threads. And so this is a kind of classic problem, for example, you have a volume knob in your audio application, right? And so the volume knob changes the volume, so the number changes, you need to let the audio thread know that the number has changed. How do you do that? Well, you can stick it into a std atomic if it's a single number, right? Or you can use atomic refs in C++20. But you need to make sure that um, this, uh, you can static assert that std atomic is always lock free. If you're using a T which is too big, there's no instructions on your CPU to do a native atomic operation, the compiler is going to insert mutexes in there, which is again not real time safe, so you don't want that. Uh, there's other techniques like uh, spin lock, you need to be you know, careful with that. Uh, I have a talk about how to do a real time safe uh, spin lock. There's, and there's lock-free and wait-free data structure. So if you're doing alternate latency, you really want a wait-free data structure. The classic is a single producer, single consumer queue, where you, know, you have a writer thread that pushes and a reader thread that pops, and you implement that with a circular buffer. It's uh, actually not that difficult to do. The implementation fits on a single slide, um, and, and you can do basically everything with this. Like if you have 
somebody playing the keyboard, there's notes coming in, you put them into a FIFO and then the audio thread picks it up or you're reading an audio file or you have it in the other direction, you wanna visualize what the audio thing is doing. You're putting the audio samples into a log VQ and then the GUI thread can pick them up. So it's a good way of shoveling data between threads. Uh, if you have to do IO, again, you can't do normal IO on the hot path, right? But you can push your message into a wait VQ just as we just saw, and then you can pick it up on another thread where you do the actual I.O. or logging or whatever it is. If you want to have I.O. between different processes, you can use shared memory. Uh, with hardware, you can do direct memory access. And if you don't um, kind of have a flow of data from one thread into the other, but you have just a single object, for example, that you have to share between threads, like they both have to have access to it, and one of them is the real-time thread, um, then yeah, if it's just a single integer or float or something like this, again, you can put it into an atomic. If it's a bigger object, there's again a range of techniques. If the hot path is doing the reading, there's a technique called cast loop, which Dave Roland and Fabian Van Giles described in a talk. I'm almost done, almost done. Uh, uh, and there is RCU, which you can use if, you, if the hot path is doing the writing, there's a technique called double buffering, and there's another technique uh, which I recently discovered which is called seclog, which is really cool. So I wanna do at some point a talk and a blog post just about seclog. It's a really, really cool technique, but also kind of difficult to get right, kind of fascinating. Error handling, you can't throw exceptions because that's a dynamic memory location general. So you can return an error code like the C people, obviously not great API design. You can use that optional, but then you lose the information about what the error was. You can use that expected, which is actually really great for this, which we have since C++ 23. Um, I talk a lot more about this in my other talk. Uh, that was my CppConf keynote last year, but actually later I did a version of meeting C++, which is the version you should be watching because there's a few bug fixes in there. And then this is the last thing. Um, sometimes you have cases where you want to prevent memory from being swapped out. Like this is the case if you have a big sample library, you have like 20 gigabytes of data, but you want them to be, ac be accessed really, really quickly, so you want to pin them into RAM so they're not being swapped out. So every modern operating system has calls for this. Uh, and you want to avoid these context switches between user mode and kernel mode, right? So on mainstream operating systems, you can set threat priority. Uh, on a real-time operating system, you have some kind of deterministic threat scheduler typically. If you control the hardware, um, then you can do a kernel bypass. And if you really only care about the critical path in your single thread, uh, you can do things like turn off hyper-threading, which again is bad for bandwidth, but good for latency. Um, and then you can pin your critical path uh, to one CPU core so it doesn't get moved to a different CPU core. Again, you save cycles. Gonna skip this. And this is all I have. Thank you. Oh. Can I say one more thing? It's gonna take one minute. Okay, go okay. ahead. One more thing. I'm gonna do another talk at a conference called CPP on C in the UK in June, which is about a completely different topic, C++ and safety. But for this talk, I'm doing a little experiment. I'm doing a survey about undefined behavior and what it means for you. So it's three very simple questions and one of them is optional. So really it's just two questions, completely anonymous. I'm not collecting any emails or anything. Uh, but if you wanna help me with the survey, go to tmodelaudio slash survey or use this QR code. It takes two minutes and I'm gonna reveal the results in June at that other conference. Um, yeah, it's a little experiment about um, how people deal with undefined behavior in C++. So if you wanna help me out, if you are programming in C++, that would be very much appreciated. And now I'm done, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the good overview. Still, yeah, okay. Uh, one remark, uh, when you talked about the ring, bu ring buffer and audio, something I like to bring up is that most of us have heard it, right? When the system locks up and the uh, audio card is still oh, playing yeah. the da, ring da, buffer, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's <laughs> then you can hear buffer, a ring buffer. Yes. <laughs> um, the other thing, uh, you said on the branch prediction that likely, unlikely, uh, only changes code gen, but I think in general, if, if the branch predictor hadn't, hasn't seen the jump yet, there's like rules, does it go down or does it go up? 
Like if the jump goes up, then it expects it's a loop and it will predict to go up. So uh, there are some cases where it makes sense, but yeah, use likely and unlikely if you know what your ISA can do. Um, there are also some instructions that have this in the encoding in, in some of the CPUs, but in general, yeah, it's a <laughs> difficult topic, I agree. Um, then you mentioned that I put want to put SIMD in C++26. It's not only that, uh, it's also in the TS since 2018, and there is an implementation in GCC, so you can use it experimental SIMD. And if that is, uh, if GCC is a dependency, you don't want to have a single one. Though, so I only also have an array-based implementation of the TS, so you can use that already. Sim, you don't have to wait for 26. And then you did the count if. <laughs> um, I just quickly hacked this benchmark uh, using GCC 12 compiled with O3, and the non-sorted variant it auto-vectorized that, so it was much faster because it was branch-free, right? Uh, the sorted one was much slower, and then I implemented this using uh, std experimental simd implementation, and it was even faster than the auto vectorized one. Not yeah, by much. So that that one is actually really dependent on the the compiler and the hardware. Like I did the benchmark like I think six years ago for like a talk at, in 2016, where I saw a massive speed up on two compilers, but not on the third. <laughs> But maybe hardware has evolved since 2016. So I think if I were to do the same benchmark again, probably I would see like. You're, like you're really right. It, it's about the branch predictor, and the compiler understood that the branch would be bad here, and it mm. completely avoided that. That's I, interesting. I guess even without vectorization, it could avoid that. We have like conditional moves and so on where you don't have to do the branch stuff. And, and so a good compiler. Would see what it's what you're trying to <laughs> to do so to him. In 2016, try to avoid two out of the three major compilers were not able to do that. Right. But I'm gonna do the benchmark again. So right. thanks uh, but, for that. But you're right. right. It, it's it's a dangerous one, uh, and if it creates a branch, it will be really bad. Thank you. Uh, I, I have one question for for you about the Cindy implementation of the T of the TS, which is the minimum GCC uh, version. So GC11 was the first release to have it. Uh, I did some further improvements, and you should take 13 if you can. It was released Wednesday. <laughs> More questions? You are really tired. OK, thank you very much, Timur. And let me take only a couple of minutes and we'll be done. So, well, I hope that you have enjoyed uh, the conference. Definitely, I have enjoyed. Don't say now, I will send you an evaluation form in a few days. And uh, there will be some incentive of, for filling the evaluation form, so we have some uh, free licenses of C-Lion, and we have also some uh, free ebooks of uh, one book that we got from uh, the Manning Editorial. So we will make those uh, among those who fill the evaluation form. So I, we, we hope this is an incentive. Any, anyway, we would be very grateful that you give us as much feedback as you can, uh, because uh, I hope to have uh, a using STD CPP uh, 2024. So uh, more than that, uh, I have no many not many things uh, to say. I think uh, we have had two very intense days on. On C++, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you now we are always here for any cooperation around the C++ language. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you.